My name is Chuck Slatkin. I'm from NYC Free Assange. I'm going to take a minute to talk about who we are. It was about uh, two years ago that uh, a number of us came together to an event like this that was in coordination with an International Day of Action for Assange. And we decided, well, one day wasn't enough. So we decided at that, at this location, to come back every week. We will hear every Thursday from 4.30 to 6, holding signs, banners, speaking to passers-by. After a number of months, we decided that we wanted to go and have a, a different location, a little more heavily trafficked, so we went in front of the New York Times and we were there every week doing the same thing, handing out leaflets, holding banners, signs. Months, and then somewhere at the beginning of uh, 2020, we decided to go inside to the Grand Central Terminal, and we were there every week, handing out leaflets, and at that location, we actually were also showing uh, the collateral uh, murder video as we were engaging with people. And we did that for some time until uh, COVID came and got in the way of those kinds of public gather gatherings. We've been continuing to do our presence uh, in social media, but we've had events. We were here on January 3rd, the day before uh, the UK Magistrate Court was going to rule on, on Julian Assange. We were here for an event at this same location. So we feel that it's essential for people to be engaged and involved. And we also understand that when dealing with Julian Assange, we're dealing with a narrative, character assassination, a propaganda that has really turned so many people off uh, to him and his struggle that should be here and should be here today. So again, I wanna thank everybody who came out today because there are a lot more of us who didn't come today. And it's really important because uh, there's no reason on the second anniversary of his kidnapping from the Ecuadorian embassy in the UK and then is taken to, the, to Belmarsh prison that there's any rational reason for Julian Assange to be in prison today and facing these charges for the crime of telling the truth about the war crimes committed by this and other countries. So it's really important for us to come out here. If you want to keep track of what we're doing, we're, we have a website, NYC Free Assange. We're on Twitter. We're on Facebook. And we do things like this. We have uh, no paid staff. We are not uh, uh, have a, a, a board of directors. And basically what we do is get the issue of Julian Assange defending free speech. But that's our issue. Yeah, we're like a one-issue group. People work on other things other ways. But for today, it's uh, Julian Assange. And the last count I heard, there were uh, uh, demonstrations, rally vigils in over 40 cities around the world. Uh, and that, that's good. It's a good start. There needs to be over 400 cities around the world and people coming out because... Uh, we, we've got to do a better job and reach more people about the truth of, what, of who Julian Assange is, what WikiLeaks has done, what it means for us, and uh, you know, the crimes against uh, Assange when uh, you know, we used to say in the streets that the, the people who committed the war crimes, ordered the war crimes, and covered up the war crimes are walking free and Julian Assange is in prison. There's something definitely wrong with that. So again, I also want to uh, thank uh, some of the invited speakers today. Uh, Randy Credico, who did a lot in promoting today uh, on the shows on WBAI, unfortunately can't make it because uh, Bianca's not doing well and he's upstate and had to take care of her. But he wants to thank everybody for coming here and, and uh, he's, he's sorry that he was unable uh, to make it. So uh, we're going to start off with one of our uh, 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 
speakers. Uh, uh, this is probably the third or fourth Assange event. He's been here. He's a historian. He's the author of Tragedy of American Science from Truman to Trump. Uh, Clifford D. Connor. Thank you. Well, here we are again gathering at the British consulate to demand justice that's been repeatedly denied. I see quite a few familiar faces here. Uh, you've heard the definition of insanity, doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different outcome. So the question is, are we crazy to be here once again, standing in the rain, demanding that the British government stop tormenting Julian Assange and set him free, when they haven't heeded that demand before, is it unreasonable of us to think there's a chance for a different outcome this time? And the answer is no, it's not a, entirely unreasonable because the political context has changed. When we were here last year, Donald Trump was still in the White House and William Barr was the Attorney General. Trump and Barr had demonstrated absolute unwavering hostility toward Assange and the British government had shown itself to be totally willing to accede to anything Trump and Barr wanted. But by the following time we were here, on January 3rd of this year, Barr had resigned and Trump was a lame duck. A new president had been elected but hadn't yet taken office. The new president-elect, Biden, had campaigned and won office by promoting himself as the anti-Trump. Instead of acting like an irrational, right-wing, hate-spewing racist, Biden promised to present a sweeter, gentler, more reasonable face to the world. Instead of Trump's obvious disdain for human rights and freedom of the press, Biden promised to uphold them. Whether we believed that or not, it at least gave us reason to hope that the incoming administration might be more responsible, responsive to pressure to do the right thing. And as it happened, the response to our demands had already changed for the better. Not completely, but significantly. On January 3rd, we had demanded that the British government not extradite, extradite Julian Assange to the United States to face a kangaroo court trial for espionage and to free him from Belmarsh Prison. Well, to almost everybody's surprise, on January 4th, the Brits announced that they would not order Assange to be extradited, and that was a big victory. But on the other hand, they didn't free him either, but continued to hold him in prison while the United States appealed their denial of Assange's extradition. The incoming Biden administration's Department of Justice could have simply dropped the case at that point, but it didn't. It chose to continue the Trump policy. Now, when Biden took office, he appointed a new attorney general, Merrick Garland, who has been praised to the skies by Biden's admirers as the most enlightened and just public official ever to walk the, the earth. But in spite of that, Julian Assange is still being held in abominable conditions in Belmarsh with the threat of extradition still hanging over his head. So although we're not insane for hoping our demands for justice today might now meet with a positive response, the struggle continues. We have to, as the saying goes, hold Biden's and Merrick Garland's feet to the fire. We have to loudly demand that they live up to the image they've claimed for themselves as champions of human rights and freedom of the press. And the only way they can do that is to immediately and unconditionally drop all charges against Julian Assange. And they won't do, if they won't do that, we demand of the British authorities that they reject this disgraceful appeal once and for all, and then they won't even have a fig leaf of an excuse to continue holding Assange in prison. Free Julian Assange now. Thank you. Well, thank you, Cliff, once again, for showing up and uh, enlightening everyone. Uh, our next speaker is also someone who's uh, been to a number of our events and is always there when we need him to be to speak on behalf of uh, Julian Assange. He's a writer and editor for Haiti Liberté, Kim Ives. Thank you, Chuck. Let me just raise this a skosh. Okay. 
Well, thank you all for coming out. And I just, before I start, want to make a uh, mention, uh, recognition of the passing of Ramsey Clark, who would have been a great ally and defender of Julian Assange at the age of 93. Uh, over the course of our many years of working around Haiti, we rarely met a figure more towering, more engaged, more helpful, more principled in his support for the Haitian struggle than Ramsey Clark. So Ramsey Presente, and uh, thank you for all that you did in your many years. Ninety-five years ago, at the age of 24, my grandfather spent a few months in the embassy in Mexico. The U.S. ambassador there, James Sheffield, was the father of my father's best friend at Yale, Freddie Sheffield. In 1926, Mexico was just emerging from its revolution, which lasted from 1910 to 1920, more or less. And Ambassador Sheffield didn't like the president of Mexico, Plutarco Elias Calles, very much. He was pushing for restrictions on U.S. oil companies, and he was friendly to the newborn Soviet Union, which opened its first embassy in Mexico. My grandfather wrote in his letters home to his family in Bedford, New York, last night I met with El Presidente de Mexico. He's an impressive man with small black eyes that never stay still, a furtive look, heavy shoulders and a powerful jaw. His movements are decisive and he seems master of the situation although in reality he is an atheist Bolshevik and not particularly strong. <laughs> Indeed, there was a conflict brewing at that time, the Cristero War, and my grandfather explained the role that the U.S. Embassy played in that. In another letter he wrote, the political trouble and shooting which many people expected last Sunday when the churches were closed did not materialize. The trouble is still there though, and as two attempts have been made in the past week on Caius's life, the place is teeming with an undercurrent of excitement. It is certainly fascinating to watch from the shelter of the U.S. Embassy where all information about everything sooner or later arrives. It is certainly fascinating to watch from the shelter of the U.S. Embassy where all information about everything sooner or later arrives. He gushes in a later letter, the amount and accuracy of the information which our State Department has is amazing, and the way in which it is collected even more so. Now, this was almost a century ago. So the embassy was essentially a giant vacuum cleaner sucking up information, and this was before it had a CIA station embedded in every embassy, managing and recruiting and deploying agents, using modern surveillance and eavesdropping technologies to monitor every electron that moves over the internet, the airwaves, and the telephone lines. Although they, my, my grandfather's letters home took on new relevance for me when Julian Assange and WikiLeaks gave us at Haiti Liberté about 2,000 secret State Department cables concerning Haiti from the cable gate trove of about 250,000 cables from 2003 to 2010. Although they were separated by decades, the embassy reports I read in my father's, grandfather's uh, letters were much like those which Julian gave us. Both betray a supreme arrogance towards a Latin American neighbor of the U.S., a delusional self-confidence, 
and a tendency to rely on information from the local ruling class, its managers and politicians. Just as Kayes was flirting with the Soviet Union, former Haitian President René Preval was in a close relationship with Venezuela and Cuba, of which Washington disapproved. Then U.S. Ambassador to Haiti Janet Sanderson said this, Preval has a not always helpful worldview. <laughs> he is essentially cynical and often justified he has an essentially cynical and often justified view of Haitian political, the Haitian political process. And he is a nationalist politician in the Haitian sense of the word, suspicious of outsiders' intentions and convinced that no one understands Haiti like he does. Like a teacher with a student, she said, pressing him to be more expansive and communicative is what she was doing. But she found that it was often counterproductive. So this meddling reflex led Sanderson and her colleagues, the cable show, to try to torpedo Preval's Petro-Caribe deal with Venezuela, to help block a minimum wage hike to five dollars a day, winning three dollars a day instead, and to rubber stamp and pay for an election that they knew was flawed from the beginning. Washington felt no obligation to get Preval's clearance to begin deploying 22,000 troops after the earthquake of January 12, 2010. In Mexico in the 1920s, it appears from my grandfather's letters that the U.S. ambassador spent most of his time at diplomatic balls, at country clubs, and speaking to the elite in their sumptuous homes. One of my Grandfather's letters ex described the quote unquote exquisite home of the Regla family, who he described as quote, the perfect types of nobility, interested in everything, knowing about everything, and amazingly graceful. Similarly, the U.S. embassy cables from Haiti are filled with page after page of reports of meetings with Haiti's bourgeois families. The Meuse, the Boulos, Brandt, Mura, Aped, Baker. Most of the other meetings were man with managers of U.S. companies and government and police officials, or with political parties run by the National Endowment for Democracy and its two wings, the National Democratic Institute and the International Republican Institute. The cables make clear that the U.S. Embassy in Haiti was the real power behind the throne of the U.S. installed de facto Prime Minister Gerard Latortue after the February 29, 2004 coup d'etat against President Aristide. Public consciousness, opposition and outrage grew as the people, not just a handful of diplomats, could read these cables from the embassy, where as my grandfather said, all information about everything sooner or later arrives. The veteran journalist John Pilger of Britain summed it up best. He said, WikiLeaks is the most extraordinary development in journalism in my lifetime. WikiLeaks meant that everything you read was authentic and accurate. You could judge it on its face value. No journalism, even the best, could be 100% authentic and accurate, like what WikiLeaks provided. Truth-telling of the most powerful kind. Now all of us here knows what that means. Anybody who's sentient, who saw that opening salvo of WikiLeaks in 2010, the collateral murder video, where we see the video of a helicopter gunship targeting a group of men talking, among them two journalists, and machine gunned. And then you see that helicopter turn its machine gun on the van that they're trying to use to carry away the wounded and shooting that up. Carrying away the wounded. And that's not all. WikiLeaks gave us indisputable proof 
of not just these war crimes, but of the systematic torture of, of the killing of seven children after they were out gathering firewood. Now, Julian said in an interview that WikiLeaks put out this information for the courts, for governments, to prosecute the criminals who carried them out. Instead, he's the one being prosecuted. And nobody, nobody who committed these war crimes, this torture, this killing of children, has been indicted or much less tried. Not one person. Worse yet, Mitch McConnell called him a high-tech terrorist. <laughs> President Trump thought he should get the death penalty. And worse yet, Joe Biden is continuing Trump's efforts to extradite Julian Assange to the U.S. on these charges. <laughs> Julian foresaw this coming in a 2012 interview. He said, there is an attempt now to erect a new precedent in the national security sector. Any journalist that corresponds with any source is committing espionage if at some point a classified communication is made. So this administration is continuing the exact same Trump policies in Haiti, in Cuba, in Venezuela, in Russia, in China, and, yes, with Julian Assange, too. As Julian said, when he took to the embassy in Ecuador in 2012, nine years ago, and let's recall, that was under President Obama, the United States government must pledge to not pursue journalists for shining light on the secret crimes of the powerful. Let there be light. Let there be truth. Let Julian Assange be free. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Kim Ives. Uh, let's hear it again for him, because he's always uh, enlightens us and brings us good information and helps keep things in perspective. Uh, our next speaker is the coordinator of United National Anti-War Coalition, UNAC, Joe Lombardo. Thank you all, and thanks everybody for being here. This is a very important issue that's really not being discussed very much in politics in the United States. Um, the case of Julian Assange is very important for the anti-war movement, for all movements of social change, but for the anti-war movement and for UNAC in particular. At our founding conference, which took place 10 years ago in Albany, New York at a conference of 800 people, we showed the collateral murder um, video. It was introduced to us uh, by a man named Ethan McCord, Ethan McCord, for those of you who don't know, is a soldier who was um, in Iraq and was at the scene of the collateral murder video. Uh, he was a soldier on the ground that had to go and come in after everybody was, was shot up. Um, and he went to the van that you just heard discussed where some people came to try to take the wounded away and they shot that up too. That is in itself a war crime. That's killing first responders. He went to that van and he looked inside and saw the driver was dead, but the driver had his two young, very young children in the van and he thought they were dead too, but they weren't. They were barely alive, and they have survived. And he carried them out, and he carried the young girl who was about three or four out of the back seat. And before he got her out of the car, he had to pull a piece of glass out of her eye. And he brought her away, and they were brought to a hospital or some 
place and they were taken care of. But her father was dead and many others, including journalists, were dead um, in the area. And his officer, when he got back and saw that he was very moved by what happened and upset by what happened, told him to suck it up. And so that's what he tried to do. He was supposed to be a soldier. He was supposed to be able to do this stuff. He was not able to do it because before he was a soldier, he was a human being and he was affected by it. Like people are affected by these things and to this very day suffers from extremely bad PTSD. It has ruined his life as it has ruined the lives of so many soldiers who have fought in that war and other wars. In some sense, I think PTSD is almost a good thing because it shows that humanity is not made to kill other people. We're forced by this society to do it. And so Julian Assange and WikiLeaks and Chelsea Manning broke the law, or Chelsea Manning broke the law, Julian Assange did not, by publishing this confidential information. The United States makes anything confidential it makes it a secret that it doesn't want you to know about. That can be embarrassing to it. There was no secret codes or no military plans or anything like that in this. It was just evidence of a war crime. So the U.S. can say, oh, we'll make it confidential, then nobody can talk about it, and if they do talk about it, we're going to do to them what we've done doing to Julian Assange. It's an attack on free speech. And there has been a massive attack on free speech that the attack on Julian Assange is part of and that has gone along with the attack on Julian Assange. Sometimes you don't notice it because it creeps up. We saw it with the Telecommunications Act that was passed under Clinton where they changed the laws. You used to not ha be able to have one company own all the different media in one area, they changed the laws. And all of a sudden, a, a, a right-wing group, Clear Channel, bought up almost every single radio station in the country. Up in Albany, where I live, I used to be able to go to the different radio stations. Sometimes they'd have me speak on something. One of them was here, another one was there. After they were all bought by Clear Channel, they all moved into one big building. This room was WAMC, and this one was WCBS, and this one, they were all in the same building. And Clear Channel had an agenda. It was pro-war. It was pro-Iraq war. They demanded that their speakers on their station supported that war. They actually held rallies. And if the, the uh, announcers on their stations didn't come out and support those rallies, they were fired. It was an attack on freedom of speech that it all came with the Telecommunication Act that was passed by the Democrats. But it was a lot more. Remember when we went to war in Iraq? The, the journalists for the first time told that, were told they needed to embed with the military, the U.S. military. The journalists were supposed to go with the U.S. military who controlled what they saw, who they spoke to, and where they went. And when some journalists from other countries thought this was wrong, this hasn't happened before, you can't have true journalism, you can't have freedom of speech, you can't have democracy when you're controlled by the military of one side that invades the country. So many journalists did not embed with the US military. And all the independent journalists, many of the independent journalists themselves stayed when, during the Iraq war in the Palestine Hotel in Baghdad. Do you remember what happened in the Palestine Hotel? When the U.S. entered Baghdad, they sent tanks to the Palestine Hotel. They fired on it to show the independent journalists, you better get the hell out of here. There's only one narrative that's the U.S. narrative. That's all there will be. Julian Assange didn't agree with that, so he's in prison. So they want to kill him. They want to bring him back here and make him die. Um, when Bush 
went to Spain. Two of the journalists that were killed in the Palestinian hotel were Spanish journalists. All the journalists in Spain came out with their cameras and their notebooks to see Bush in Spain. Then they put their cameras on the ground, they put their notebooks down, they turned their backs on Bush and refused to cover it. What did the US media did do? You might remember an editorial that was N on NPR, the liberal media in the United States. It said if you didn't want to be killed and you didn't want to be shot on as a journalist, you should have embedded with the American uh, military. NPR said that. Not showing solidarity with their own profession. Like none of them are showing for Julian Assange. But NPR said that. A little while after that, we built a big demonstration in Washington, D.C. Against, um, against the war in Iraq. 100,000 people showed up. More than that, that was the police estimate, 100,000. Usually I double that when I want to know the size of a rally. But the police said 100,000. NPR's news coverage of it were dozens of people marched in Washington, D.C. You don't get the truth anymore in the United States. I recently, we watched um, a, a, a speech by a UN official from Malaysia. He said, I've gone to countries all over the world. I listen to the news wherever I go. When I come to the United States and I turn on the news, I know nothing. It is an information vacuum. It is an information desert. That's what happens. They control it. When we started doing demonstrations during that period, they told us you can't protest everywhere. We have free speech zones. I always thought the United States was a free speech zone. They corral us in areas and say, here's where you can speak. Sometimes miles away from where you... You might remember the big demonstrations that we had on February 15th against the Iraq war all over the world. Biggest demonstrations to that time. Every continent, even even Antarctica had demonstrations. We had a million in, in London, a million in Rome, a million in Tokyo, uh, 500,000 here, another 250,000 in San Francisco. The police told us then, you can have a march or you can have a rally. You can't have both. That's a crime against freedom of speech. So if they win, if they are able to extradite Julian Assange. It is a blow to Julian Assange, but it is a blow to all of us. It is a blow to freedom of speech. It makes our job of telling the truth, of being truth tellers, talking truth to power, much, much harder. We cannot let it happen. For Julian's sake, for our sake, and for Pete's sake, let's free Julian Assange. Yay! Thank you. Thank you. That was Joe Lombardo. Let's hear it for Joe. Okay. What, you're going to... Two minutes. You're going to be late for this? Uh, I'm going to put another speaker on there. Yes. Well, we'll see how this works now. Speaker. Say hello. Hello. Can put, you hear me? Put, put this yeah. right up, right up to this. Let's see. Go ahead. Go ahead. Talk more. All right. It's Randy Credico oh, from here. upstate I, I New York. Can you hear me? Yeah. All right. I'm sorry that I'm not there today. I wanted to be. I've been talking about this on every one of my past um, six or seven radio shows and podcasts on Assange. Uh, but unfortunately, one of the biggest Julian's supporters, if not the biggest, uh, got very sick, and I'm taking care of that individual today, and that is, of course, my dog, Bianca. I uh, got to take her to the uh, 
uh, hospital later on today, and so uh, she's uh, very ill. I, I know she'll pull through, and I will say that uh, Julian is well aware of this dog and how important it is to me. Uh, back when I got a subpoena uh, in September, September or October of 2017 from the House Intel Committee, Julian said that saying, take that dog with you before that grand jury and I will pay for it. <laughs> so, and, and Julian, furthermore, when I visited him the last time in 2017, um, November, we spent a half an hour, this is one of the reasons why I love this man so much, talking about how much he misses not only his family and his kids and all of his friends, but how much he misses his dogs back in Australia. He had blue healers, these um, working dogs, and he talked about these working dogs for about a half an hour, 45 minutes, and so he, that, that in and of itself made me so uh, in love, or I love this guy and admire him, the fact that not only did he like my dog, but he had his own dogs, and he cared about them, and he missed them, and he'd been ensconced in this Ecuadorian embassy now for seven years without visiting his dog. Now he can't visit anybody, or people can't visit him once in a while. I, 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 I want to say thank you to Chuck and Bernadette and uh, Patricia and uh, Cliff and everybody else who was there today. You are, as Tom Payne said, a true, uh, you're all true winter soldiers. This is a significant case. Um, journalism, the future of journalism and free speech is in jeopardy in this country. It is important that we have the asses of the masses on the street if we are going to be victorious in this true crusade to free Julian Assange. And what you do is critical. I wanted to be there today. The rain wasn't the reason. I was there back on uh, January 3rd, and it was raining, if you recall. I even got bought an umbrella. Uh, but it really is uh, the dog. I'll send you a picture of her. Listen to me right now with a WikiLeaks cup full of water as we speak. Um, I, I just want to say sorry that I'm not there today, but I am in spirit. What you're doing is pivotal. And please continue, get involved. John Pilger was on the other day. Neil Melzer said, don't wait for the light, be the light. And that's what you're doing today, you're being the light. Thank you very much, and uh, continue the struggle. Great, okay, thank you. Well, that worked and made uh, him happy and us happy too. Uh, so uh, our, our next speaker is a founding member of uh, NYC Free Assange, and he was a member of the uh, Transit Workers Union Local 100 Executive Board from 1997 to 2006, and he's seen everywhere. Let's hear it for Marty Goodman. Yeah, uh, thank you everyone, thank you friends. Uh, this is the first time I've actually wrote a speech that comes in the time limit. So this is historic. Uh, the award-winning journalist, let me take this off. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Else yes, yes. I got my two shots, thank goodness. All right, the, the award-winning journalist, Julian Assange, has been unjustly imprisoned for two years in a UK gulag, and before that, seven years in refuge in London's Ecuadorian embassy. Yet his case is barely known to the people of the US 
and he's an international hero and symbol of freedom. But we are also imprisoned ourselves by a corporate culture transfixed by a Russiagate psychosis that denies and smothers the truth. But thanks to Julian and brave truth tellers like Chelsea Manning and Edward Snowden, we now have a glimmer of truth about the savagery and lies surrounding US aggression in Iraq and Afghanistan. The appalling role of the Clintons in impoverished Haiti and even within the United States. The bugging of the cell phones of our, for our foreign leaders, our so-called friends, and all the rest of it. It was everything the left imagined, but worse. The New York City Free Assange.org and my organization, Socialist Action, say that Julian Assange is absolutely, totally innocent and must be freed now. Yay! No one has contested the accuracy of a single document released by WikiLeaks, and despite the ravings of the twin parties of capital, no one has been harmed as a result of the disclosures, as US officials themselves admit. Moreover, there has been no evidence presented in court of any Russia connection, as if that ipso facto uh, would imply a heinous crime. The Mueller investigation likewise revealed no such connection to Assange. Assange's innocence is no different than Daniel Ellsberg's heroic release of the Pentagon Papers, which showed the world the monstrous truth about Vietnam. Ellsberg, who never spent a day in jail for his act of supreme courage, says that Assange's actions are no different than his, and he demands Assange be released immediately. The New York Times published the WikiLeaks documents, as it did the Pentagon Papers, knowing them to be true, yet only Assange remains in an overcrowded, COVID-infested jail. This entire assault on press freedom has been choreographed by an enraged U.S. imperialism, no less by Democrats than the Republicans, whose mafiosa politics have been blown sky high by WikiLeaks. <laughs> Truly, it will take a revolution to dislodge this tiny ruling class that has its boots on all of our necks. What now for Assange? Niz, Niels Melzer, the United Nations Special Rapporteur on torture said in December, quote, I can attest to the fact that his health has seriously deteriorated to the point where his life is now in danger. Despite these dreadful warnings, Assange remains imprisoned and denied bail while awaiting U.S. appeals on extradition. And they know this. Very likely they want Assange to die in jail like they wish for racist frame of victim, Mumia Abu Jamal. Please join our New York City Free Assange.org in building a mass movement to demand that President Biden drop all of the charges against this internationally recognized free speech hero. Free Julian Assange, free the award-winning journalist Mumia Abu-Jamal, free Leonard Peltier, and all political prisoners. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you. Let's hear it from Marty Goodman. And now, and now we're going to play something uh, uh, 
from a phone. Uh, actually, this is a, a, a recording of uh, Mamiya Abu Jamal speaking about Julian Assange. It runs about eight minutes. I hope it works. Yes. And we, we hope it works. Julian Assange, perhaps one of the best known of the WikiLeaks collective, spent seven years in the Ecuadorian embassy in London until, under circumstances that remain unclear, his asylum became his detention pending his extradition to the United States. Why? Because WikiLeaks revealed the crimes of the U.S. Empire in Iraq and Afghanistan, where U.S. forces killed non-combatants for fun, including journalists. Assange's group showed memos and video of U.S. armed forces joking while killing, and the consequences of the imperial war based on baseless lies. Assange, by passing on these memos and tapes to U.S. and global journalists, revealed the cruelties of imperial war and how easily such wars are accomplished. That is his crime. It is for that reason that he's in detention again in the United States of America, awaiting the reality of a free press. The question arises, of course, is Julian Assange a political prisoner? I don't think there's any question that can reasonably be asked about that, given the fact that he is a prisoner and has been held in asylum by governments, by states, for acts that are legal, that are in the public interest, and that tend to inform people of that which governments don't want people to know about. There can be no question on this issue. And because of that, I think you know the answer. And as someone who has been charged for being a member of a political organization and convicted and sentenced to death, I think I have some insight on that matter. Julian's run. First things first, who is Julian Assange? And secondarily, why is his struggle of import to any of us? Assange, born in Townsville, Queensland, Australia in 1971, is the founder of a global online media service known as WikiLeaks. As such, Assange is a journalist. This group has been a blockbuster, capturing and passing on files and internal memos of governments all around the world. For this, he has been hounded, targeted, and jailed, now serving over 50 weeks for allegedly jumping bail in Britain to avoid extradition to the U.S., which seeks to jail him for violating the U.S. Espionage Act. As shown, Assange, born into a British Commonwealth state, Australia, is not an American and owes it no fealty. But the U.S. Empire rules the world, not just U.S. territory. On July 25, 2010, WikiLeaks published on its website some 75,000 documents on the Afghanistan war. These documents presented a damning portrait of the U.S. Empire at work. WikiLeaks revealed the crimes of the U.S. Empire in Iraq and Afghanistan, where U.S. forces killed non-combatants for fun, including journalists. Assange's group showed memos and video of U.S. armed forces joking while killing, and the consequences of the imperial war based on baseless lies. The Iraq and Afghanistan wars are now widely considered to be the biggest blunders in U.S. foreign policy. For these wars of regime change floated into being 
on an ocean of lies and misinformation. Quick, remember weapons of mass destruction? How many thousands and tens of thousands died based on an American mirage? Assange, by passing on these memos and tapes to U.S. and global journalists, revealed the cruelties of imperial war and how easily such wars are accomplished. That is his crime. He wasn't spying. Spies work for governments and militaries. Journalists work to inform people to drop the reaches of democracy. In the not so recent past, the U.S. Empire used its tools of repression to silence its opponents, even when they were allegedly U.S. citizens. The targeting of Julius and Ethel Rosenberg comes to mind. They were called spies and subsequently electrocuted. The cases of Seco and Vanzetti, immigrants from Italy, comes to mind. The targeting of the New York branch of the Black Panther Party and the trial of the Panther 21 on trumped-up charges also comes to memory. The question arises, of course, is Julian Assange a political prisoner? I don't think there's any question that can reasonably be asked about that, given the fact that he is a prisoner and has been held in asylum by governments, by states, for acts that are legal, that are in the public. Pennsylvania State Correctional Institution, Mahanoy. This call is subject to recording and monitoring that are in the public interest and that tend to inform people of that which governments don't want people to know about. There can be no question on this issue. And because of that, I think you know the answer. And as someone who has been charged for being a member of a political organization and convicted and sentenced to death, I think I have some insight on that matter. Julian Assange is a prisoner of a political vendetta. Is he thus a political prisoner? You damn bet you. When you attack the empire, of course, the empire strikes back. For publishing documents that embarrass the United States, Assange is convicted. Faces over a century. In fact, one 175 years in prison. And as a foreign national, the First Amendment to the Constitution does not provide a defense. So, wait. The U.S. can invoke its criminal law for use worldwide, but the Bill of Rights doesn't obtain the foreigners, right? Yeah. That sounds like from a prison nation. This is Mumia Abu Jamal. Thank you, Brad. And thank you, uh, Richie Marino, also, for uh, making that available. Okay. Okay, uh, our next speaker is a founding member of NYC Free Assange. And she also has been our representative with the uh, National Assange Defense Committee, uh, Patricia Dahl. Thanks. Hello, everyone, and thanks again for coming out today. We've heard a lot of interesting and valuable history uh, uh, lessons we've had today, and I'd like to continue that. Can you all hear me? Okay, um, I'd like to continue the little bit of history that uh, we've heard today. It, we all know that Julian Assange is the first journalist to be tried for espionage. We're at a, a historical crossroads. It's important or useful for all of us to remember that when the Espionage Act passed in the U.S. over a hundred years ago, it did so only because Congress, after a very long debate, 
uh, forced President Wilson to strike out a press censorship provision that was attached to it. Uh, the, and what will we hear, or what are we hearing today from our Congress on press censorship and the espionage charges? Uh, the senator from California, Samuel Johnson at the time, made a very important speech and he said he didn't believe that the espionage charge was drafted in terms of uh, you know, aiding and abetting our enemies. It was drafted specifically for censorship in the press and for ordinary people on the ground. Another, I'd like to bring that history a little bit more into the current time. Let's remember that WikiLeaks registered its domain in 2006. By 2008, the Pentagon, in the secret document by their cybersecurity assessments branch, drafted a document that detailed ways to destroy Julian Assange and WikiLeaks. Now that was before any of the material on which the espionage charges were applied were even published. So the, it, that more than anything shows that this trial is an utter sham. And you know, we are going to have to pay close attention to how this go, moves forward at this historical conjuncture. Um, so I would just like to say that, again, thank you all for coming out. It is very important that we stay the course now. Uh, we're at, you know, uh, it's over 10 years. A lot of people say it's a 10-year it's a uh, hunt at, for Julian and at the capture of Julian, but it's really more 12 years because those ideas to capture him were before all of these files were published in 2010. So anyway, today is a day of shame for the U.S. because we talk about protecting our freedom of speech and we are prosecuting a man who has devoted his whole life in service to the public interest. Free Julian Assange. Let's hear it again for Patricia Dahl. And actually, uh, all our speakers who came out today, uh, either in person or, or over the phone, thank you all for, uh, for coming. I uh, want to remind people that uh, NYC Free Assange is still active and continues to be active. You can find us uh, at nycfreeassange.org. Uh, uh, at uh, NYC Free Assange on Twitter and uh, Facebook, uh, NYC uh, Free Assange. So once again, we want to thank everybody for coming and we really give yourself uh, a round of applause because we all know who are here today how important this is and there uh, needs to be uh, as many people as possible and, and you're an important part of that. So anyway, we want to just uh, Thank everybody for coming, and at this point, we'll end uh, uh, NYC Free Assange's uh, activity for today on behalf of uh, Freedom for Julian Assange and Drop the Charges. Now, if you've gotten the, uh, the, 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 the flyer, it may seem like an exercise in futility for some, but it's a, an effort that we can all make to either uh, call the Justice Department, and the phone number is on here, and call for them to drop the charges against Julian Assange. Uh, there's a, a, an email uh, address and also an address to send a letter to Attorney General America Garland. It's important uh, that uh, they don't just assume that we don't care. It's worth a few minutes to make the effort and tell uh, the, the supposed new administration with a new policy to uh, drop the charges that were started by the previous administration. But it's important for us to make the effort and do that because the bottom line for, for what we're doing is to get freedom for Julian Assange. Dropping the charges makes that happen. And once again, thanks everybody for coming.
you want to do it. Oh, okay. Free Julie the Slug! Free Julie the Slug! Free Julie the Slug! Free Julie the Slug!